good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Gorowski, and I'll be your host for today. For those who might be new to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, we're all about bringing science, adventure, exploration, and conservation live into classrooms across North America and beyond. So now that the school year is back in full swing, we are broadcasting live into classrooms for 30, 40, even 50 live events every month. So please do join us. Check out what's coming up at exploringbytheseat.com. All right. Well, today we're taking a little virtual field trip, one of our favorite things to do, and we're joining up with Stuart and the Darwin 200. So the Darwin 200 has just completed a seven-week circumnavigation of the UK aboard the tall ship, the Pelican of London. Along the way, a team of young scientists and filmmakers documented the health of the ocean waters around the UK. This is part of a larger expedition setting sail in 2021 to follow the most important expedition for natural history, Darwin's voyage of the HMS Beagle. So it's my pleasure now to introduce explorer and biologist Stuart McPherson, who's leading the expedition, and he is live from the Pelican, docked at Canary Wharf in London. Hey, Stuart, Hello. how are you doing today? Hello, Joe. It's lovely to see you. I'm with my friend, marine biologist Rowan Holt as well, who's one of the Darwin 200 divers. Um, it's lovely to see all the children and schools again. And with Sarah Darwin a few few days ago, so it's a pleasure to speak to you all. Uh, hi everybody. Yeah, I'm Rowan. Um, as you were saying, I'm the one of the divers on board the Pelican of London. We've had some really amazing adventures over the last few weeks, and hopefully uh, we'll we'll talk through some of those now. Yeah. And at a point in our talk, we can show you our ship, the Pelican of London. She's a beautiful steel hold tall ship. Um, that, that we've sailed around the whole of the UK and are about to take around the whole world. All right. And Stuart, we were able to have two very exciting events during that seven weeks. We did an event live from the Isle of Lewis, which was pretty awesome. Got to see some of the signs going on on board. And then I'll never forget 150,000 gannets uh, on Bass Rock. And I mean, it was incredible watching. I can only imagine what it was like for you to be there. Everything going on around you it must have been incredible. It, it really was. It was very loud and very, very, very squawky. A lot of birds flying around nonstop, pecking at your feet as well as you went through them. So very, very loud. And quite smelly as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could almost smell it through the virtual connection. Yeah. I could only imagine. <laughs> very cool. Well, Rowan, why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the dives you were able to do? Yeah, well, we had quite a good range of diving all the way around the UK. And we started off on the south coast near the Isle of Wight, then moved further west into the Scilly Isles. Now, both those areas down there are sort of they're temperate waters, but quite warm. It's really quite nice and comfortable to dive those areas at about 18 or 19 degrees. But of course, as we moved further north, as we came up into Scotland, the water got colder and colder. But we dived some of the amazing fjordic systems, big, steep-sided, glacial-cut valleys in Scotland, where we could be diving, say, on a on a great big cliff face underwater with about 80 to 90 meters of water below us. And we were going fairly deep, maybe 30 or 40 meters down. But the wildlife on those walls is incredible. You know, we're seeing things like um, soft corals, lots of feather stars, um, lots of different species of fish. And there was even a jellyfish that had a look at Stuart quite closely <laughs> as well for a bit. <laughs> very, very, very yeah. All right. Well, came, Stuart, yeah. Okay. As well as the diving, there was a lot of other science projects going on. Can you tell us about a few of the other uh, projects yes. you were taking part in? Absolutely. So we've, we undertook 10 different projects. We're using this ship, if I now just borrow right, the very quick. This ship here behind us, the Pelican of London. We can happily give you a tour later of it if you'd like one. Um, we undertook 10 projects from it. And the idea is to use the ship as a floating platform for science and outreach. So we studied plastic in, in our waters, both microplastics and macroplastics. We undertook a whale and dolphin survey, all the different whales and dolphins. We saw 115 different records all the way around the UK's waters, as well as bluefin tuna, which is very special because they were almost wiped out in UK waters, but they're coming back. It's a really lovely success story and um, lots and lots of sunfish. In addition to the wildlife surveys, we also studied a great a number of uh, different elements of different pollutions. So phosphates and nitrates, 
at different points around the UK's waters. Um, we also undertook an experiment using a 19th century bucket and compared a 19th century measurements against modern techniques to see the, the impact of different techniques and, and the implications on the data in, within, in partnership with the Office of Meteorology. So that worked really, really, really well. We had 10 young scientists that beamed out live little lectures and little, little projects and films interpreting their data as they went round. We're creating at the moment a series of maps to showcase that data and feed it in into different databases around the world. Yeah, that, that's what we accomplished. There we go. Absolutely amazing, Stuart. Why don't we board the Pelican now uh, and maybe uh, you know, a minute or two, show us around, and then we'll bring our special guest, Sylvia, in to join us for a little conversation. That would be, that would be a pleasure. We'll walk down it and show you her length. So um, this is the Pelican of London. This is the Sorry, Stuart, I think, I know it might be a bit more difficult, but I think you've got to stay in front uh, if oh, you're okay. behind. Sorry. Sorry, we'll try it that way then. She's a 45 meter long ship. She's um, got three masts. She's a Barkentine. She's steel hulled. And um, if you look down to the back here, you can see all the That's where all the sailors on the ship live. We've got 45 people on board. And HMS Beagle, Charles Darwin's ship, was actually smaller than this going around the world. It was approximately, from memory, I think 36 meters long. It's so actually smaller than our ship behind us. And it had over 60 people in it. We had about 40, a team of about 45. And um, yeah, you can see, you can see, uh, see the mast here behind me. And all of the young scientists climbed up into the rigging, all the way up there. It was incredible climbing up to the top of the rigging, up, up on the yards, these big horizontal sections here, and watching dolphins and whales swimming all around the ship. We were very, very lucky and had some incredible sunrises and sunsets and saw a lot of beautiful wildlife. So it was very, very lucky. We'll show you just the stern here, then we'll go on board and hand over to our special guest. So um, this is the Pelican stern. If you look carefully, children, you might see the wheel where the captain commands the ship here at the back. Um, he, the captain is normally in the wheel in that wheelhouse here. And there's a few sailors at the back here with the um, with the wheel here, just over there. We've been sailing amongst islands and beautiful sea lochs and across the open water for the last seven weeks. But we're now in a concrete jungle in the middle of London. So it's a bit of a difference and a bit of a contrast. Oh, they're up there. That's it. Well done. So it's a bit of a contrast what we've had over the last few weeks. So we'll go board her now and hand over to our guest. All right, excellent. So we'll follow you as you go on board. While you're doing that, uh, I am going to introduce our guest who really needs no introduction, but I'll give it a try anyways. So we are so excited to be joined by National Geographic Society Explorer and Residence, <laughs> Sylvia Earle. Uh, called her Deepness by the New Yorker and the New York Times, Living Legend by the Library of Congress, and First Hero of the Planet by Time Magazines. She's an oceanographer, explorer, author, and lecturer, formerly Chief Scientist of NOAA and the founder of Blue Mission and Sea Alliance. She has led more than 100 expeditions and logged more than 7,000 hours under the water. So Sylvia, it's absolutely incredible to have you joining us live for this Darwin 200 event today. Great to be on board so to speak. Oh. <laughs> yes, you are definitely on board. <laughs> oh, welcome aboard. Well, it's such a privilege to, to be joining you on this expedition. I hope uh, in person at some point along the way, I'll be there in spirit the whole way. Oh, that's wonderful. We look, look forward to it very, very, very much. We look forward very much to welcome you aboard in person. I, I think... I, I try to imagine what would surprise Darwin the most if if he could be looking over our shoulders right now. I think he would be astonished, among other things, that we could be communicating the way we are. 
Yes. I, I have a copy here of my well-thumbed book of Darwin's voyage around the world that depicts his <laughs> expert. I love books, but I also love the new means of communicating that didn't exist when I was a kid. It certainly didn't exist when, Char when Darwin was a child or when he was out there cruising around the world. This five-year expedition. The world has changed so much. What would Darwin be most uh, surprised about? All the new technology, of course, the very idea that anybody could go to the moon, let alone beam back images from the moon that looked at Earth. I mean, kids today are so, uh, you know, you're so lucky when you think about what you know that nobody could know, even when I was a child, let alone 200 years ago. Because the very thought that we could lift ourselves out of our atmosphere and go up into space or to take ourselves into that world that Darwin never got to see, diving. He didn't have a face mask or flippers, let alone a scuba tank or a submarine to go to the deepest parts of the ocean. Now we can, now you can, just wait. You know, the next few years will be assuredly the greatest era of exploration ever. I mean, I, people think, oh, if only I had been around 200 years ago, all those new discoveries that for the first time, people got to see this or that or some other thing, but most of the ocean has yet to be seen by anybody. Of course, it's underneath the surface. We know pretty much about the nature of the surface of the planet, but we don't very much about what's underneath. And that's where this voyage is going to make some, make a real difference. And to go back to the same places that Darwin got to see and, and make the comparison. Think about 200 years ago, there were still great auks in the North Atlantic. The very last one was seen in 1844. When you think about, they used to be as noisy and numerous as the gannets that you just saw, but they're now all gone. Let's hope that 200 years from now, there will still be gannets out there hooping it up, doing what it takes to make more gannets and have their contribution to being a part of the planet. I think among the other things that probably would astonish Darwin would be knowing how far we have gone in terms of our technologies and our explorations, and yet to be aware of how much we've let slip through our fingers, how much has been lost, mostly because we have been unaware of why it matters, the diversity of life, knowing that not just in 200 years, but mostly in the last 50 years, in my lifetime, the loss of Carl Rees, where Darwin was such a pioneer in terms of exploring Carl Rees, defining how they were formed, you know, really giving us insight that is still valuable insight, despite our new means of exploring and understanding <laughs> Carl Rees. He, he's pretty sharp in so many ways in looking at how coral reefs are formed and figuring out that these are the kinds of puzzles that are still out there to be, to be worked on by, by you. There's so much we still need to understand and understand why are we letting the natural world slip through our fingers? I mean, it's, I heard Ed Wilson, somebody, if you don't know who Ed Wilson is, check him out. He's one of my personal heroes. He has as one of his personal heroes, Charles Darwin, most of us do, who work in, in science. But Ed Wilson on his 80th birthday 
celebration in New York City said, we're letting nature slip through our fingers. The flip side of that is, nature's letting us slip through hers. When you see what's happening to the world, to realize we are dependent on the natural world, holding coral reefs, kelp forests, gannets, the whole living world safe. We have a chance as never before you do, especially. This is a time, the next 10 years, perhaps the most important in the next 10,000 years of what we can do, what you can do to learn about nature and why it matters to everyone, everywhere, all the time. And also what we can do, what you can do to hold the planet steady. Throughout all of our history, even during Darwin's time, it was the habit of humans to consume nature to foster our prosperity. I mean, all creatures do. Birds do, fish do, <laughs> trees take a place in the forest. It's their place and they take nutrients. They, you know, other things can't live where they live. It's their place. So everything uses the natural world, but no species has been more aggressive or comprehensive in displacing everybody else on the planet in favor of us. <laughs> well, there are limits to how much we can displace or eliminate and still have a planet that works in our favor. You are so lucky to have come along at just this moment in time when we're beginning to understand these things. Imagine if we didn't know. We, a couple hundred years ago, casually let the great auk disappear. We let so many species slip through our fingers and we're so close to letting others go the same way. But ha, now we know. Think of what you have called superpower of knowing what could not be known before. And the superpowers that we have with technology coupled with that tried and true gift that humans have and that kids have in super abundance. And that is curiosity, inquisitiveness, asking questions, who, what, why, where, when, how, don't ever stop asking those questions and huh, finding the answers and, and sharing the view. I love the fact that in the coming months, coming years aboard this beautiful ship, retracing Charles Darwin's voyage, you will be sharing the view with those on board and to think about your personal voyage going forward. What are you going to do? What new discoveries are you going to make? You can do it in your backyard. <laughs> that hero of mine, Ed Wilson, who specializes in ants, as far as I know, there are no aquatic ants, but there are a lot of ants anyway. <laughs> and the idea that we can look at the any creature, whether it's a terrestrial one or something that lives in the deep sea, and make an understanding that we're all connected. Everything connects to everything else. But Ed Wilson noted that in the bark of a tree, it could be growing right there in your backyard, in your neighborhood. There's still mysteries, still discoveries to be made. In the cracks in the sidewalk where you see moss growing or brave little plants coming up in the middle of a city, there are discoveries there if you ask questions. Who are you? What are you doing here? How are you making a living? Now, it's really exciting to go to the deep sea where, for the most part, everything you see is being seen for the first time by humans. But you don't have to go far away. If you keep asking questions, keep looking for how does the world work, keep asking, who am I? What can I do? What can I really be the best at, that be the best of anybody in the world? For Ed Wilson, it's ants. 
the best in the world, maybe, at, at understanding who they are and what they do. I love marine plants. That's what really sparked my curiosity and still does. But I have begun to focus, as I hope you will, on pick up anything and to realize that it connects to everything, including you, whoever you are. So I look forward to hearing your questions. You know, there you go, ask them. <laughs> and you've got some experts here ready to tune in and give you their insights. Oh, and I really look forward to this expedition where as the ship travels along making explorations, you can be a part of the scientific mind, this greater mind, this collective mind, asking questions, trying to figure out what does that mean? And have you thought about this? Or what about that? It, it's great to have more engagement from people all over the planet. And, and that, I think, would really delight Charles Darwin to be one of the kids, <laughs> part of the action. All right, over to you. Big salute for everything you're doing. So pleased to be part of the crew. And that, that is exactly, exactly what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to make the world's most exciting classroom, beaming live from the ship as a floating laboratory, sailing around the world, putting out competitions, experiments, beaming experiments live from the ship for students to replicate. We're doing little um, science experiments, interactive projects, lectures, competitions, essays, which we want you guys watching to all be a part of. Every single day of the voyage and every week, we're gonna have a live lecture nonstop right the way around the world every single week called nature hour so we hope next about just about this time next year we'll be leaving in november we really hope you guys all engage and as sylvia so 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 perfectly and so beautifully put it it is absolutely the greatest time in discovery of natural history we want you guys watching to be a part of this and to journey every day around the world with us so over to the questions all right all right amazing so we do have a great group of classrooms joining us we've got classrooms joining us on camera we've got classrooms joining us on youtube and facebook so keep those introductions coming in the chat sidebars i'll give a couple shout outs right now we've got someone tuning in in india we've got uh, a group of students in north palm beach florida we've got a marine biology student hanging out at plymouth university grade sevens in toronto ontario who are tuning in so keep those intros coming uh and we'll give some shout outs but let's start grabbing some questions so Let's see, I'm gonna to go to our first live class here. I'm gonna bring them in. There they are. Miss Saunders, grade six, is hanging out with us in North Bay, Ontario, here in Canada. How are we doing today? Um, good. Um, Dr. Earl, I was wondering, what were your dreams when you were a little girl? Dr. Earl, what were your dreams when you were a little girl? Oh. <laughs> Well, I was inspired by William Beebe and his book, Half Mile Down, where he got together with an engineer, Otis Barton. Nobody told them to do it. They were just following their curiosity. They wanted to know what's under the surface. So they built a submarine. That was the engineer's job, building the submarine. But together, they went off the coast of Bermuda. They went a thousand meters down and they described the most extraordinary creatures that they saw. And it captured my imagination and said, I want to do that. Later, I, I read Jacques Cousteau and he described how you could breathe underwater with, you know, I wanted to do that. So I guess wanting to be a scientist. I never occurred to me to want to be anything else. Well, to be a mom, of course, and I am, but, but then now I'm a grandmother. I have four grandsons, but mostly for me personally, I, I wanted to explore. I wanted to do what Charles Darwin was able to do when he was a young man. 
I'm a young woman. It didn't occur to me that I couldn't do what the guys were doing. I mean, later I found out that sometimes it's people didn't expect to have a girl want to do what the guys were doing, but if it's something you really want to do, you know, whether you're too tall or too short or you're too fat or too thin or too old or too young, don't let that get in the way. Go for it. That's what I wanted to do. And that's what I've been doing. <laughs> All right. What a great question. And uh, I mean, couldn't ask for a better answer. Go for your passion and don't let anything stand in your way. Amazing, Sylvia. So we've got a question here coming in via the YouTube. And I think this is a question that we can direct towards Rowan and Stu. And they're wondering, I mean, there's lots of ground you're going to cover as you go around the world. But is there a part of the expedition or a place that you just can't wait to get to? Um. I think my favorite one of all is a little island called St. Helena in the oh. middle of the South Atlantic. I've been very, very fortunate to visit it already filming a, a series, um, but I, I only had a little time on there and I can't wait to go back. It's a tiny little island, but it's been isolated for millions and millions of years. And it has the most extraordinary wildlife on it. Not big things, mostly invertebrates, little insects, which by the way, Charles Darwin absolutely loved. And I have a little story for you about this. So many people think of Charles Darwin as an old man, um, but when he did his Beagle voyage, he was 22 when he started and he loved beetles. I'm not <laughs> sure if you guys like beetles. One day he was searching for beetles and he turned over a log and found a really rare one. So he picked that up in one hand he then saw another beetle emerge. So he picked that one up in his other hand. But then an even rarer one came out. So he put that one in his mouth and then had picked that one up. But the one in his mouth bit his tongue. So he spat them all out and they ran off. And um, yeah, poor old Darwin ended up with no beetles at all. Um, so um, St. Helena has some incredible beetles. It had, and it has some incredible insects, as well as a lot of amazing birds and incredible marine life. It's a, a center for um, whale sharks. So, um, so it would be, a, that, that personally for me, I think can't, can't wait to go back. Oh, and incidentally, it's where Napoleon Bonaparte was exiled to, and most of the bugs are named after Napoleon. So... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he would have liked beetles and cockroaches and insects named after him, but um, but I think that's my favorite. What, what about you, Rowan? Well, my upbringing as a uh, marine biologist and diver has been largely on the west coast of Scotland, and there we have all these beautiful sea lochs, which are really sort of like fjordic sort of systems like you get in Norway, which have great big deep sort of... Um, big vertical walls with amazing cliff faces. But I know if you go into Chile, Chile has some of the same sort of features there, but the species, the different animals and plants that grow there seem, seem to be bigger and shinier and look really amazing. So what, what I'd like to do is compare what I know from home to what you see in South America, which is an awful long way away from where we are now. But uh, apparently there's quite a few things that are very similar as well. So that's what I'm looking forward to if we get there. So we're going to try and take a live camera feed. And so one of the nature hours, you guys watching might be able to watch Rowan underwater swimming with the wildlife in real time via satellite. Now, wouldn't that be cool? Hopefully no sharks come along and gobble him up. <laughs> My friends are sharks. We love sharks. All right, Sylvia, let me turn that to you. Is there a spot in the world um, that you'd be excited to see the expedition visit? Well, of course, the Galapagos, it's iconic. And, and I know everybody will have a sharp focus on the Galapagos, but especially the part of that treasured place on the planet that Darwin never got to see. And that is the underwater part. Now, I first had an opportunity to go there in 1966, a long time ago. There were only about a thousand people living among the islands and there, there's no indigenous population of people on the Galapagos Islands. 
and part of the reason that it's special is it's been isolated for most of its history and only in relatively recent times have humans actually settled there. But the fact that 97% of the land has been protected as a national park starting in 1959, 3% is occupied for human use. But it's taken a while to realize got to do the same thing for the ocean if you really want to protect the creatures on the land as well as the iconic creatures that live in the sea. About 20% of the organisms so far discovered around the Galapagos occur only in that little speck in the Pacific Ocean. The others have you know, ties elsewhere, but nonetheless, they all connect back to not only the, the other creatures in the water, but also on the land. So the flightless cormorants, that are iconic creatures for the Galapagos. They're connected to the ocean. Of course, what are they going to eat? Hmm. They eat the fish, little fish. Most of them actually the little endemic sardine-like fish that really form these great schools that the endemic penguin, the um, boobies, the, the, oh goodness, all of the seabirds go to the ocean for groceries, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and the sea lions. When I first dived there, it was, I thought, the sharkiest place on the planet. And there, there's so many of them, and not just the sharks, but other fish as well. Grouper, there's an endemic grouper that occurs only there. There's also one that has is more widespread, but you know, it's, it's not surprising that there are unique creatures that occur there and only there underwater as well as on the land. So going back there and comparing what Darwin saw and making the connection land and sea and realizing that we have to do a much better job of protecting both, but especially the ocean. When you look at how much of the ocean is safe for the fish and the lobsters and the sea cucumbers and the sea urchins and all the other creatures that live underwater in the Galapagos, it's about 4% is safeguarded highly. There's an area around the Galapagos going out 40 miles that has, is considered a marine reserve, but it's okay to fish there. There's under consideration right now, the idea of expanding protection within the exclusive economic zone of Ecuador around the Galapagos. That's a concept that Darwin would have to have explained. What is this, an exclusive economic zone? <laughs> what is a, a park in the ocean? Those concepts were, were, were not even thought of at the time. But now we have this authority to govern parts of the ocean. And, and it's important as this expedition goes to the Galapagos to put a light on, on what is happening what needs to happen perhaps in order to really embrace the ocean as well as the land with care, to celebrate the good things that are happening and to see what contribution can be made now to make sure that in another 200 years, the ocean will be as productive and full of life as it is today. Just as it's exciting to see no species on the land have as far as we know, been truly lost. Some subspecies of mockingbirds are gone. Some of the, at least one of the giant tortoises, you know, they're gone. But generally speaking, we've done a pretty good job on the land. We have to do a better job in the ocean. So going to the Galapagos, that's where I want to go. <laughs> All right. Good choice. Let's take a little trip to Minnesota now. Mrs. Fromm's fifth graders are hanging out with us. Let me bring them into the live stream. Oh, look at that hand. How right. are we doing, Minnesota? I'm doing good. So she has a question. I can't see anything. Oh, you can't see anything? You can hear you loud and clear. There we go. All right. All right, Addison. Um, I was wondering if so, um, Dr. 
Dr. Earl has ever um, discovered like a new species of like fish or animal in the ocean. Have you ever discovered a new species of animal or fish? That's so easy to do. <laughs> oh, wow. It's so easy to do. There's so many, especially in the, especially in the deep sea. Um, I, my specialty is seaweeds and I've personally described half a dozen, but I have given insights when I'm out and working in an area, including the Galapagos and see something that's, that's looks unusual. I hand it over to the specialists who are fish people or those who are crustacean specialists. And they're the ones who have the knowledge to be able to really go through the process. There's a, a formal process of, of naming and describing new species. So I feel comfortable doing it as a scientist, as a botanist looking at the plants. And, but I, I give it the authority over to those who have de described, I have a sea urchin named after me. <laughs> There's a sponge and several species of seaweeds uh, by my fellow botanists who, but I, I, the one that I really enjoyed the most, I think was a, a little species of red algae that was growing in the Juan Fernandez Islands. And it looks like a little palm tree. There's a stalk and then branches. It looks a bit like an umbrella that is blown out with the wind where you've got the stalk and then this explosion of, of little branches. My major professor was known as, it's Harold Hum, H-U-M-M. -M. So in trying to figure out a name for this new plant, I, with my fellow students at the time at Duke University, we had this little brainstorm about what to call this new plant. It looked like a little umbrella underwater. So we decided Humbrella. So we could, oh, yeah. <laughs> so it was a patronym named after Harold Hum, but it was also a descriptive epithet because it was like a little umbrella. I mean, you can have fun with your science, why not? But I have to say, huh, we know in the ocean as a base on the basis of the census of marine life, it took 10 years, scientists all over the world on expeditions, looking at libraries, looking at museum collections and going out discovering new things during this 10 year period. We came up with an answer that there are about a quarter of a million known species of animals and plants and even microbes in the, in the ocean as of 2010, which is when that expedition came to an end. And what we they also discovered is that we're just scratching the surface, literally. There are at least 10 times that number in the ocean yet to be discovered and named to be seen, let alone given a name. So there's so much more to do. And when you start talking about microbes, the little guys, <laughs> imagine Darwin getting to understand the importance of viruses. They didn't, he didn't even know, no one knew about the existence of viruses. Most of them are really important in terms of making the world function the way it does associated mostly with bacteria. Who knew? Even when I was a child, the, the knowledge of the importance of microbes to life on earth, including the association that we have, the, the good <laughs> associations that we have with microbes and viruses. And occasionally there is a virus that has an appetite for humans. And we're experiencing that right now, but we have the gift of knowing what they are and huh, but there's so much more how many viruses are there gazillions <laughs> it's a good scientific term or, or microbes or insects uh, charles darwin loved insects everyone should we think of what uh, some people think it would be a great world if we got rid of all those bugs no 
we need them. We need the bacteria, we need the viruses, we need the fish, we need all of this, all of these creatures, and we need to give them names, get to know them. That's part of the excitement of being a kid right now. There's so much left that you can do to greatly enhance the world and knowledge about the world we live in. All right, let's take a little trip to Miss Michael's class in <laughs> Illinois. Let me bring them in. There we We're go. How are you doing, Michael? I just need to tell you that we love insects. I've got a tarantula sitting next oh, to me on my desk right now that we spend time. And uh, and crickets and all sorts of things. So we are with you on the insects. Um, I have a question for you from Henry. Um, Henry, do you want to uh, unmute yourself and ask? Yeah. How long have you been diving for? That's a great question, of course. <laughs> That's James pitching in there. I started diving when I was a teenager. Uh, I was one of the first ones with the ability in the United States to have access to scuba. It was 1953. A few people had already been uh, able to dive in in uh, this country, but not very many. And my my instructions were pretty straightforward. It was breathe naturally. That was it. Jump in, breathe naturally. <laughs> Don't hold your breath. Well, now we know there are things you should know before jumping in, not holding your breath, breathing naturally. So again, you're lucky to come along now when you can safely um, take on the ocean or fresh water anywhere using scuba, using submarines, using remotely operated vehicles. So how about the others tuning in here? Joe, are you a scuba diver? Of course you are. I sure am. Yeah, I've been diving. I lived in Australia for a year in 2007. So I've been uh, diving and training ever since. It's there's, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like exploring that world that not a lot of people get to explore and discover. How about you? Yes. Yeah, 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 I've been diving since I was 15. So don't let it stop you just because you're young. And you know, I've, I've done thousands of dives now, and ev I remember every single dive right through my diving career. I mentioned I've got a logbook as well, of course, but uh, <laughs> there's lots of memorable dives in there. Um, my mother waited uh, 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 until she was 81. Don't wait wow. until 81. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in nowhere near your league or the Rowan's league, but been very, very fortunate to do quite a few dives including one with Rowan a few weeks ago in the Scottish sea lochs. Oh. And just looking down on those underwater cliffs and including actually, um, that's one really interesting we often saw at the bird colonies. The birds would all be living on the cliffs and on the islands. And many people forget that the cliffs continue in some cases, a hundred meters or more below the water. And it's, a, it's two worlds on top of each other. The world's on top, like at Bass Rock with, thousands and thousands of beautiful gannets and seabirds, then the world in exactly the same place, but just below, literally the same spatial area, just below on the same cliffs, a wonderful, beautiful world of coral and dead man's fingers and starfish and sea urchins and so many. Yeah, magical, magical. So yeah, you guys watching, you young naturalists out there at the classrooms, Get out there and start exploring. One day, learn how to dive and start snorkeling on your holidays and, and follow Sylvia and Rowan's examples because they're, they're amazing. You could do yeah. it in a river too or a lake. Yeah. yeah, cold water diving here in the Great Lakes in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's bring in Miss Kronecki. She is joining us from Connecticut, representing her class. How are you doing today? I'm well, thank you for having us. And my class is on with us also virtually, so thank you. Um, actually, one of the questions that came up from one of the, a couple of the students was about diving. But we're also this week, but we've been focusing on, this, on the UN global goals. So this week has all been about you know bringing attention to the global goals. And a lot of the students are really interested in goal, goal number 14, which is life below water. So I guess our question then would be, how well do you think that goal is being met and being accomplished and what is it we can do to help with um, helping to achieve the goal by 2030? Well, 
there is a goal by 2020 to have 10% of the ocean protected. We're not there yet. We're not at the end of 2020 yet. And it's exciting to see around the world leaders using their superpower as leaders to take action. The, the last time I actually, before everything kind of <laughs> shut down, I was in the Seychelles in February of this year. That country, under the leadership of President um, Farrar, has, has declared 40% of their exclusive economic zone for protection. Chile, similarly, has expanded rather quickly over the last 10 years or so from zero, or very small number at least, to about 40%. The goal for 2030 is 30%. Some nations are stepping up and doing their part to exceed that goal. But where we are right now, um, you know, it's if you include areas that are not highly protected, but have some form of protection, it's about 7%. 3% to go if you want to be generous in terms of what you're saying is protected. But if you want to protect, again, looking at the Galapagos, highly protected 97% of the Galapagos. Only 3% is allocated for human use. Highly protected means even the fish are safe. Even the lobsters, even the squid, even the shrimp have a safe place to live. If on that basis, it's only about 3% of the ocean is protected now. But going back to the time when in my country, when President George W. Bush established the Papahanaumokuakea Marine Reserve, which at the time was the largest protected area of the ocean, that the, the ocean as a whole was less than 1% was protected. And then along comes President Obama, expands the Papahanaumokuakea Reserve. So that it became the largest during the same year that it was in the largest area, again, a big, larger than that area in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands around Antarctica, the Ross Sea, that became the largest area. So even though they're generally speaking larger than anything before, we have to think much bigger and much faster. The best chance we'll have is in the high seas, beyond the area where nations claim jurisdiction. We applaud countries such as, as Chile, uh, such as the UK with their overseas territories, establishing large areas around Pitcairn Island, large areas in the Indian Ocean and in the Atlantic. And, and you know, it's getting better but the high seas represents half the world. That's the global commons beyond national jurisdiction. And when Darwin 200 voyage takes off around the world, most of the time will be across the high seas beyond national jurisdiction. Right now, nations are deliberating through the United Nations. How much of the high seas can be established for full protection? biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. It's on the table right now. We're carving up the, the, the ocean, literally. It's on the table. How much of our life support system will we agree to keep intact? How much will we agree is important to leave in a natural state where we don't kill the animals, where we don't take the wild wildlife the wildlife in the sea. How long is it going to take before we humans realize that life in the ocean should be attributed, accorded the same kind of respect we give to wildlife on the land? The biggest wildlife trade on the planet is industrial fishing. How long before we wake up to the importance of fish alive? as well as, of course, fish on our plates. So these are the things that are being deliberated 
on your watch, your decision, your time. It's now. So don't let this time slip by. We must not let nature slip through our fingers out there in the ocean. All right. We have one more class to visit. They're joining us in Ontario, Canada. Uh, Mr. Armstrong's Hello. class. Let's bring in. Mr. Armstrong, if you don't mind Perfect. unmuting. How are you doing? Can you hear me? Awesome. I, I'm gotcha. going to try uh, what another class did this uh, session for the first time. I'm going to try and unmute one of my students so they can ask themselves aloud, if that's okay. So you will hear them even though you don't see them because they're a virtual class as well. So here we go. I'm going to give Anthony the floor in a second. Anthony, I'm going to ask you to be loud and clear and hopefully they can hear you through the microphone. So go ahead, Anthony. All right, I think we might have to play with that a little bit, Mr. Armstrong. It doesn't sound like it came through for us. And I think you might have accidentally muted again. I'm gonna unmute there. There you go, you're back. There he is. Did you hear him? Uh, One more time, you, Anthony. Can you relay it, Mr. Armstrong? I think you and I might have to play around with it for the next one. Okay, he's asking, what are the most boring and the most fun parts of your job? <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Why don't you start us off, Stuart? Okay, well, um, my background is climbing hundreds and hundreds of mountains. Um, I'm a botanist, a little bit like Syria, but overland, rather than underwater. And one of the tricky things that I find in my work I climbed hundreds and hundreds of mountains in the past 15 years looking for carnivorous plants, new species of plants that eat, eat bugs. <laughs> and often, <laughs> and in some cases, animals, believe it or not, they can trap animals as big as rats on very, very rare occasions. Um, I spent yeah, hundreds of years climbing them. And often you have to go for days and days and days uh, climbing mountains, living in tents, getting higher and higher towards the misty, beautiful summits. And often the only thing you can take with you because of the weight is crackers or rice or pasta and a, and a can of tuna. So one of the trickiest things, I guess, is, is living out for weeks sometimes at a time in remote jungles and living on quite basic food. That's probably <laughs> one of the trickiest things. What, what do you guys think? Yeah, well, one of my favorite things to do is if I'm surveying underwater, which is counting things in the seabed. And then we get disturbed by something like a seal will come along and want to play. And that is definitely the most exciting bit. The worst bits, of course, are all the paperwork that has to go with um, sort of organizing things and that sort of stuff. But we try and forget about that. It's a necessary evil. We'll, get, we'll live with it. What do you think, Sylvia? Is there a part of your job that's not your favorite? Well, hmm. Can't think of anything that I don't love. <laughs> Even the paperwork. Here's the thing. When I am forced, when I'm forced to sit down and, and do an accounting, it makes me put things together that I didn't think about before. If, if they, there's a discipline involved when you have to write something down and 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 give it a degree of of uh, concentration that you hadn't hadn't uh, hadn't thought about before so being bored i think is unacceptable you just <laughs> it's just to be alive is such an exciting thing you, you, it just imagine it's every day even even in under circumstances that that aren't your favorite things it's still great to be a witness to life as it is occurring and, and if I start thinking, hmm, what can I do? I've got all these books I haven't really looked at in a while. Books I haven't read. Books I have yet to write. <laughs> all right, let's bring you back in. We have a young scientist on board of the Pelican who would love to pop in and ask a question. We do indeed. <laughs> 
Yes. I'm one of the young scientists that have been on this voyage, and I'm also a really keen diver, so it's fantastic to hear about diving stories. My question was, what are the biggest changes that you've seen in the oceans just during your career? Sadly, more, more, more plastic and fewer fish. <laughs> more people. Having more people underwater is a good thing because, especially, you know, if they behave themselves, treat the ocean and treat the creatures who are there with respect. Do unto fish as you have fish do unto you. <laughs> but we need witnesses. We need people to see what's there. And it, it, it's hard to care about something if you don't know about it. Now we know what we could not know at any time in the past. And it's because people are getting out there, down there, and are bringing back the observations that we need to have. And I think it's exciting to go to a place and find that it's still in great condition, but it's harder and harder to find those places. Again, I think if we could bring Darwin back today and take him to places that he knew. <laughs> Go to the Galapagos Islands. I think he'd be astonished to see, well, first of all, he'd be astonished to see cars, <laughs> but to realize that it wasn't long ago. In fact, when I first went to the Galapagos, there were no automobiles at all. Now there are traffic jams on the Galapagos Islands, stoplights, you know, people have to be careful about where they go. <laughs> and. and the, to imagine that there are actually uh, the kind of development, we call it development, the, the growth of human presence in places that were truly wild when he first went there. And not just Galapagos, but in places around around the world. Even imagine if he could go back to where he where he was as a child in, in England, how astonished he would be. So even in my lifetime, I'm astonished at the changes that have come about. You know, a lot of good changes. I love the fact that with this little device, I can tune in to you, to the rest of the world, and have you, we're speaking as we are right now. But to take that knowledge, to take that technology and turn it to good purposes of maintaining the integrity of the planet that keeps us alive. I think that's our highest priority in the next piece of our existence. It's the most important thing we can do to hold the planet safe so that in another 200 years, there'll be kids asking the kinds of questions you're asking right now. Sorry, can you try and maybe just angle the computer? We're Sorry. just losing you a bit. Sorry, that, that's absolutely right. And um, in, in our voyage, Charles Darwin wrote on the origin of the species. <laughs> We're hoping to write on the future of the species. And to echo Sylvia's points, that's absolutely right. We have to all work together to build a brighter future and ensure that the beautiful wildlife, both underwater and on land, is conserved for the next 200 years with your children's children's children. So that's exactly a wonderful message um, and, and something that we absolutely hope to follow and hope to engage everyone in. So yes, definitely. It's just, if I could just jump in, I love the idea of imagining Charles Darwin as a kid. Yes. Because it was when he was a kid, he developed his love of insects. Later, he fell in love with barnacles. He wrote a big book about barnacles, pigeons. He wrote about pigeons. He wrote, he was just like every one of you should be curious. Look around you. Your, what are in your backyard? Have you not noticed before when you start to really look? Look at the spiders. Where do they live? How do they make a living? <laughs> or, or try to put yourself in the place of any creature that, that you might know. Where does a pigeon go when it's not right there in front of you? 
Where's its home? Who are its buddies? <laughs> Pigeons, sparrows, common things you think, but maybe not so common when you think about how they make a living. I, the idea that Charles Darwin was just a kid when he set out on the voyage around the world. Imagine you being in his place, but imagine him being you in your place. <laughs> what would he make of the opportunities you have that he did not have and could not have? You're so lucky to come along in the 21st century armed with what we now know that you know and can make a future that is going to be a whole lot better than, than what would be the case if we did not understand what we now understand. Absolutely. So I hate to have to be the one to draw this conversation to a close, but because uh, it's been absolutely incredible. It's been so great to have all the classrooms joining us live uh, on camera, uh, to have the groups who are joining us live via Facebook and YouTube, and to, to have you, Stuart and Rowan, uh, and our young scientist friend on board the Pelican. It is so uh, exciting to think that this journey is just getting started. The voyage around the UK was just the start, and there is so much more to come uh, to excite and inspire students all around the world. And Sylvia, of course, you know, your words, your message is so powerful. The ocean is resilient. If we give it space, right, it can recover. Mm -hmm. As long as we haven't taken the last one. <laughs> yeah. Or two. <laughs> All right. Well, Stuart, thank you so much. Rowan, thank you so much. Sylvia, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, for this Darwin 200 event today. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks again, everybody, for today. We are going to sign off for now. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.